Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. I was surprised to receive the amount of interest that I did in this dress from The Shine Lookbook, what I've been calling my Realtor in Tomorrowland dress because it does look a little bit like I should be showing you around some sort of like Jetsons-ish apartment that you were considering buying with like fancy kitchen gadgets. It's a little bit 1950s meets retrofuturism, which is something I of course really enjoy and something that Tomorrowland at Disneyland kind of exemplifies. But I digress. This of course is another of my color blocked projects where I take one of my base patterns and kind of slice it into a million pieces and torture myself by making it sort of a quilted patchwork instead of just a normal dress. But because I had so much interest in this dress and I already had a couple of fabrics earmarked to make different versions that were very similar, I decided to do a poll over on Instagram to see what color combo you would all like to see first. And this gray and reflective abstract rainbow sort of weird print one. So that is what I'll be using today, this kind of strange spandex and sateen, a cotton sateen, mixing those together and doing another one of these color blocked dresses. So let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom as always and get started. And we begin with my all-in-one bodice block front and back. Again, you can see me make this here on the channel. And here is today's sketch versus the actual dress from the Shine lookbook. So they are a tiny bit different. If you want to see these, I'll actually post the sketches over on my Pinterest as well. So I'll link those below. If you wanted to follow the striped pattern of that other dress exactly um, versus this one, whatever pattern you want to do, you know, this is completely open to your own creativity here. Um, and speaking of creativity, I can't do the exact same thing twice, especially when it's this much work. It's just would be too painful. So <laughs> I'm going to change it up a little bit today. The stripes uh, down the side of the skirt are going to be in a different direction. And overall, the stripes are just like a tiny bit different. Very similar idea overall and the exact same techniques. So if you wanted to follow that other dress's stripe pattern that will be available to you on Pinterest to reference. But first things first here in my tracing of my front, I've drawn a line from the apex up into the shoulder because I'm going to separate this into a shoulder princess line. Technically, uh, it's a lot of color blocking in general. In addition to that, as you can see here, I'm drawing the stripes down the center front of this and there will be a center front seam as well. So I've added a uh, half inch down the center front too. And let's separate this little shoulder bit up here. I mean, a lot of these things don't have names. Um, you'll just start seeing me labeling them by numbering them or lettering them so that I don't get confused later on. I draw little arrows to show which way is up so I don't get lost. Sometimes I'll mark the side seams. I'll just put an S where the side is so I know, oh, this is the side seam. Um, so I don't get lost. And I'm working all these little pieces in here with center front as well for where they interact with the center front. But I can go ahead and start cutting this out and making more decisions about where all these blocks are go. The entire concept of this stuff, again, is just taking uh, a pattern that you know fits, drawing shapes on it, and then in this case, like, you know, straight lined shapes, you can do curves as well. Um, and then separating those pieces apart, adding seam allowance so you can sew them back together. That's the general concept here. So I'm gonna cut this apart through this central line that's going through the apex here. And then I can go ahead and just cut this dart right off. Goodbye. I'm just gonna smooth out this area right over the bust just a tiny bit, cuts off about an eighth of an inch. And this is now my side front and my front. And we have essentially a shoulder princess. Again, I'm going to be making a video all about princess seams. I keep saying that, but that's because it's gonna be kind of an evolved video that will be coming up soon here um, about both shoulder and armhole princesses because they do have a few more steps if you wanna do them the nice way. But as you can see, the slapdash way, does work because we're doing it again here today. And I'm just drawing in this line so that it matches up with one of the stripes on the front, labeling that one, two, three, because this side front is only gonna be separated to three pieces as opposed to the front front here, which is in about a bajillion pieces, as you can see, because I decided to go for only one inch wide stripes on the center front of this one, which I think it's one and a half inch stripes on the other dress I made, but I wanted to fit in an extra stripe. So now they're thinner. <sighs> But because I cut this apart along the center here, along this princess seam, I need to add seam allowance so that I can sew it back together. So that's what I'm doing here first before I start cutting all my sections apart. And now I can cut everything apart and add seam allowance. <laughs> and I'm gonna go piece by piece and add seam allowance along the way here. Of course, this is sped up like 1600% faster than I actually can do this. But you know, each part of this, each color block, each block of color gets cut apart, seam allowance added so it can be sewn back on. Um, I did have a couple people say, you know, why don't you just applique this kind of thing? I find this easier than applique. Like as many steps as this is, I find patchworking far easier than applique. I find applique incredibly annoying. You may not feel this way and you may enjoy applique. And if that's, you know, the case, good uh, for you. But I just, I, I find applique really irritating and much harder to get to look perfect as opposed to like just sewing a seam. Um, but of course here down the front, all these stripes, it's a real good time of just adding tons of seam allowance onto all of this. 
you really use up your scraps of paper doing this kind of thing and a lot of tape in fact i you know keep <laughs> scotch tape boxes of tape rolls of tape in here because i do go through quite a lot of it but presumably other people do less pattern drafting than i do because of course i do it all the dang time but here are all my pieces you know kind of re-layered up it's just that same thing we just have to cut everything apart you just cut apart your puzzle pieces and add seam allowance to everything make sure you label the crap out of your pieces as i always say so make sure everything says front everything shows which way is up what the grain line needs to be draw all over those for the bodice back the process is similar although i like to keep things nice and smooth and uncomplicated where the zipper is going to be so you'll see here that down the center back i didn't add any additional color blocking no blocks will be added into the central panel of the back here so i'm just tracing my all-in-one bodice black block back here drawing in the dart and i'm going to grab some pieces from the front to reference for doing the back here so let me grab the little shoulder block to see how wide that area was for the front that way i can reference that for the back i'm just raising my back neckline and i want this line to go through this dart but my dart is over like a quarter inch from having a nice line i'm just going to move that dart over a quarter inch moving the dart over a quarter inch on the front where it's actually you know it's pointing towards the apex a problem this in the back it's not pointing towards you know the point of the bust it's just pointing towards like the back where your shoulder blades like create a bit of curve on your back and so it's much less picky so i just moved it over a quarter of an inch whatever so that i could have my nice line going through it um i have referenced the front piece along the side seam here so that this can match up along the side seam and then i've added a stripe above it that doesn't match up with anything on the front it's just there to look nice on the back and so i've added my little one inch stripe here so of course the back side back here is still less pieces than we have going on the front and the uh, central back piece is one piece and therefore the easiest one for the bodice back center back here i'm just gonna make sure that this has one inch of seam allowance just because i've been giving myself more seam allowance lately why not you know give myself room to work once again labeling everything as much as possible so i don't get confused later on and then separating it out along the back princess seam and then again adding seam allowance to that separation before i start cutting my pieces apart so that i don't get confused later on and then of course now i can cut everything apart about the side back and add seam allowance to each piece this is very repetitive because it's a repetitive process and therefore the video is repetitive i'm sorry about that you know we really these projects are not difficult they're just tedious you know nothing mad is going on here other than repetition all right so now i have all my back bodice pieces with seam allowance added where it needs to be anytime the pattern gets cut apart seam allowance is added otherwise it is already inherent in the pattern let me grab my pencil skirt front here so i can start figuring out what i want to do for my skirt once again i'm going to be kind of combining the two darts here on the front of my skirt into one um dart for a like princess seamed skirt as well to line up with the seam going down the um, center of the bodice as well so let me just trace this i've added a half inch along the center front of this so that i can have a center front seam on this skirt in addition to my princess seams oh there's airplanes outside i haven't had to worry about plane noise in so long thanks to the panini here we haven't had a lot of air traffic in general um anyhow i'm tracing my original darts here and then i'm gonna about to draw a new one but i move it later so we can kind of ignore what i'm doing here honestly let's skip ahead the plan here was to uh, add the fullness from that first dart that i've crossed out here to the second dart and just have that second dart be encompassing of all my dart fullness so it's a two inch dart instead of two one inch darts i have one two inch dart i'm going to narrow the side of my pencil skirt here by one inch down at the seam and just taper that up into the hip but then i remembered i want this line to line up with the front and i haven't even referenced this yet so duh silly me i need to move the dart over so that it lines up with the princess seam on the bodice um as well so i'm going to put that in here and redraw a two inch dart from this mark basically just drawing in a dart completely ignoring the original darts of this skirt pattern basically uh this is basically putting one two inch dart in the middle of those two original darts so it's a good compromise honestly so i'm just drawing this new dart in here in brown marker you can kind of tell the difference if you have this large enough if you're watching on your phone you probably can't tell the difference between my purple and my brown marker honestly but i've crossed out my original darts i've crossed out my first one i drew and this brown one here is going to be my new dart and so I have this separated down the middle of that dart because that dart is not going to be sewn. It's going to be kind of eliminated in a princess seam in the two panels. And then I've drawn in all the stripes I want. And I have drawn those uh, like two inch wide stripes at the top. And then it tapers down to a one inch wide stripe 
just so that it um, kind of tapers down the leg, uh, the width of the stripes changes. Grade eights down, which is kind of fun, I thought might be a nice touch for this one. Um, of course, here on the front, I'm just making it up. And on the back, I'll need to match up these stripes. So uh, whatever I do on the front will have implications for what I need to do on the back. But again, it's just my pencil skirt pattern that I've separated into different panels, you know? Once again, I'm just patchworking this stuff. Uh, not a lot about it. The fit is changing a tiny bit with this uh, dart becoming princess seams, but not a ton. So once again, I've moved this dart, but I'm just cutting it away. And now I have just the curve where these two get sewn back together. But of course, if they're going to be sewn back together, they need seam allowance. So that's what I'm adding now. Indeed. How often am I like repeating myself and saying, of course, in this video? Too many times. But of course, you're used to it. Oh no. All right, here I am adding all my seam allowance at bajillion times speed. Yes, this does take a little while. It takes me, you know, maybe two hours to make a pattern like this total. Yeah, probably like an hour and a half at least. But I'm just going to separate this. I have labeled these which ones are going to be one fabric and which ones are going to be the other. It's all about that labeling, you know. Here I'm doing the same sort of thing to the back of the skirt pattern. That's right. Uh, although I am just going to leave. I don't know why I do this. In the front, I eliminate the dart. In the back, I just keep them. The, dart, the darts in the back are a little bit bigger. And I, again, I feel like when you're dealing with the curve of the dress over the bum, I want it to fit nicely. So I'm leaving the dart in this back panel. And again, this back panel isn't being separated into different pan, um, like color blocks. I'm going to keep the center back panel of the skirt, just like I did with the top, devoid of any extra interest because it's going to be where the zipper is going in. And I like that area to be as simple and plain as possible. Now I'm using the stripes from the front as reference to have them match up along the side seam along the side. So I'm just using those as reference for that. Same with down here along the hem. I am doing kind of a weird little thing along the side. Now down by the hem, I'm doing like a stripe on one side and then just doing a color block here in the back. You will see what I mean in the end. You know, this is one of those things where I'm not even thinking very hard about what I'm doing or why I'm doing it, you know? <laughs> I'm just doing what I think might look nice in the moment and hoping for the best. I'm not having a very technical reason for half the things I do. Just design intuition, I guess, or something like that, you know? It's a, it's a creative process. Shine, shine, shine. Where am I putting the fabric? Labeling those stripes here. I do have less stripes at the top on the back as well than I do in the front, so there'll be an extra stripe on the front of the skirt that lines up with like nothing on the uh, side seam. But I think it's fun to have three stripes that match up and then the last one is like hanging. I don't know. You'll see what I mean again when you see this skirt on my body later. Spoiler alert. I will model this dress for you at the end. I know. It's not what you expect after watching several of these videos, but it is true. Once again, I've cut it along the back princess seam of the skirt, or gore seam, whatever this would be called, adding seam allowance. There you go. Like so. And doing the same on the long seams before I cut the little bits apart, and then I will add seam allowance for all the little bits as well. This is where it's nice to have podcasts, as I always say. I really need to get on that audiobook train, but I'm not there yet. I'm just hoping that I don't forget any stripe anywhere along the way. Occasionally I'll forget like one bit that I need seam allowance, but usually I catch it when I'm pinning it to the fabric later. It's rare at this point that I get all the way to having everything cut out and then realize I messed up. But it does happen occasionally, you know? As we all know, I am capable of mistakes, that's for sure. Here I am laying everything out on the gray cotton sateen. This is from Joann's this fabric. I like their gray and their black bottom weights sateens. I use them quite a lot or at least the black I do. I should just buy a bolt of the black to have on hand because I use black cotton sateen so often. Um, it's probably my favorite, number one favorite fabric. But here's the gray version, it's sort of a uh, like shark gray kind of color, a medium, slightly warm gray, but I'm just fitting all my pattern pieces onto here. As you can see, you know, this is the skirt. It's just cut into many bits. Um, so I'm fitting them as close together as I can while being um, conscious of the grain line of this. Of course, this fabric does have a tiny bit of stretch in it. It is a cotton lycra blend, I believe, or cotton spandex blend, where it has like 2% stretch in it. 
So this will stretch widthwise across my body, which makes it quite comfortable to wear and good, you know, to wear to lunch when you plan on eating lunch, for example. And I am paying attention to the stretch on this weird abstract fabric as well. This is a black spandex with a um, printed pattern. On, it's like printed onto the surface of the fabric. It's not dyed. Um, it's like roller printed, but it is a weird hologram well not holographic material weird reflective material this kind of material is made out of micro glass bead dots from what i can tell um not from looking at it from having read about it online so this type of reflective material is made with micro pieces of glass so that when light ref hits this it reflects like a road sign would um it's made for runners or other athletic people who like bikers and stuff like that who might be riding at dusk or at night and so when a car headlights hit you you are reflective and the car can see you. Um, so it's started off as like a safety thing. I think probably this started off other than in road signs in like safety vests for road workers and stuff like that. Um, but now of course has been used in athletic wear and this is technically, I guess, an athleisure fabric, but of course I'm using it for my color blocking today. And just like I did the color blocking with the latex coated fabrics here on the channel before, I am going to be backing all of the spandex sections with sateen. This works even better than it worked with the PK the last time because the sateen is less thick. Um, so it's less thick and textured and so responds to having the, the layering like this a lot better. But I'm basically just trying not to get confused and layering up my spandex pieces over the corresponding sateen pieces, pinning them on the corners and then setting them next to my serger so that I can go ahead and flat line all of these pieces by serging the edges. And this fabric looks black and gray and is much more subtle in like normal lighting um all the sewing today uh looks much more like what this dress looks like and even in the modeling because i have studio lights on it looks a bit uh, epic or like brighter this um, reflective fabric is picking up the lights um it looks different than it does i guess in like ambient lighting is what i'm trying to say um this dress comes alive at night as it were and if i were to stand like a deer in headlights which doesn't sound that out of uh, character for me, honestly, uh, with headlights on me, it would shine neon. So intense. It's a weird, transformative, reflective, strange fabric that I couldn't resist playing with. But over here on the machine, I'm going to go ahead and serge those edges, like I said. And please ignore the changing state of my manicure in this video. Um, I've been experimenting with nail polish a little bit lately, but I have to say now, it, the future me here talking to you now, my nails are kind of wrecked from wearing nail polish and using like strong acetone nail polish remover to get it off. So I have to take a break. I haven't been wearing nail polish for years, but I decided to get some holographic nail polish to wear during that shine lookbook. It's part of the theme and I've been playing with it a little bit lately, but it's not probably the best on your nails. So I've taken it off now and my nails are nubbins. They're very short and broken because they were weak from having all the acetone on them. But I like a full strength acetone nail polish remover because it makes the nail polish come off so fast. And I'm like taking my nail polish off. I find boring for some reason. I can't handle the patient, uh, patients required to get glittery nail polish off. So I like a full strength, very toxic <coughs> nail polish remover, which is part of the reason my nails are now weak and sad. It's my own dang fault is what I'm trying to say. Because I'm not going to be lining this dress, I have surged the raw edges of all the other pieces despite not flat lining them. So all the regular plain old sateen pieces as well, all the stripes that don't have the flat lining, I have surged the raw edges of those as well so that everything is encased and will not fray on the inside of this dress. And I'm just pinning, starting to pin all the stripes together, you know? Again, trying not to get confused, checking my labeling, checking, lining things up with the pattern pieces again, making sure I'm using the right side of the fabric that I need to be using because the sateen does have a right and a wrong side. One side's a little bit shinier with that satin weave finish. So try not to get anything turned around and messed up, which is the part of this that takes the most time, other than taping on all that seam allowance, which of course also does take some time. I'm just lining up my stripes, doing kind of like a handful of things at a time so that, again, I don't get too confused. I don't want to sew, I, I don't want to pin and bring over too many pieces that look the same over here. It's just going to get easier for me to get lost and confused, so... Try not to get mixed up, but I'll bring all those over to the machine and it's a lot of sewing straight lines. It's really good practice if you need some practice for sewing straight lines. Just half inch seam allowance, sewing my tiny little chevron stripe together. Chevron stripes over here on the 99K. 
I've loaded up several black bobbins to be able to do this. And I am using black thread on this, and that means that anywhere I'm doing top stitching today, which I will be doing a lot of top stitching, because I think it lends a kind of tactical or sportier look um, with this athleisure fabric, even though I'm making a slightly 1950s kind of inspired futuristic also dress, um, I thought that keeping the top stitching with this lends to the, like the superhero suit sort of look to it. Um, not that I like superheroes much, but I can be a sewing superhero. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I'm just going to press open all these seams and top stitch everything in the black, which is a bit of a contrast against this gray. I just thought it would be fun. I usually use matching thread even when I'm top stitching, but for this I used black thread on gray. And I did for top stitching all of this, for sewing normally I use 12 stitches per inch, um, but for top stitching this I switched it to 8 stitches per inch, so it's a bit of a larger stitch length. I did not, however, stitch, switch to proper top stitching thread, um, like you would use for denim or things like that, which is a bit of a thicker thread and really, you know, lends to the kind of top stitched rugged kind of look. Um, but I just use normal thread to do my top stitching because that there's, you know, as we all know, I'm only willing to take so many steps <laughs> or add so many things on. If I'm going to make the piece or make the dress into like dozens of pieces like this, and then I'm going to, you know, sew, press, and top stitch every single seam on this many, many seamed dress. Switching the thread back and forth is a step too far. Maybe if I had multiple machines, I could set up one machine with top stitching thread and one machine with regular thread. And then I could switch back between the two machines. But that is adding another factor in where I could make a mistake. And do we really need any more opportunities for me to make mistakes? I'm not so sure. But I'm just top stitching away over here. No problem on this spandex, by the way. Uh, same with that shiny stuff that I used for the other dress. Um, the kind of metallic swimwear fabric, which is what that other dress is um, accented with. It's very similar to this. It's an athletic spandex, basically. It's a four-way stretch spandex. Um, no problem sewing it at all. And um, of course, again, I'm backing it with a fabric that is not as stretchy. So I'm using it basically as a woven from then on. Just making sure nothing's getting confused and sewing the next set of pieces together. You can see at the under my hand on the left or uh, right hand side here, pieces are starting to get put together. Just going section by section and sewing everything together. I'm working on the two like side panels, skirt front. I can see it says SF skirt front, not San Francisco on all these pieces here. So I'm working on the two like side fronts and then the center panel of the center panels, since there's a center front seam of this front skirt will be much easier than all this chevroning nonsense. But basically all the matching work, other than keeping track of it, is done for me in the patterning stage. So like as long as I had everything match up in the paper pattern, it should match up in the fabric. I just have to not lose track of what I'm doing and not get confused, which is the real struggle, you know? Some people do puzzles, apparently I do this. And I do like to do these sort of things, um, have it all laid out like this, I guess. I like to see all my puzzle pieces in a top-down view. Um, it helps me not get confused. So for I'll do all the skirt back at once, and I'll get all the skirt back sewn together, and then I'll set those aside. I'll do all the bodice back at once and set those aside. Um, because like opening up both the front and the back of the bodice and having all those pieces, it, it, if you have them all out at once, they're going to get confused. Like <laughs> I'm trying to minimize opportunities for mistakes, which is how a lot of my sewing goes, honestly. Minimizing opportunities for mistakes is a good <laughs> motto to have. Mostly just because, again, I hate unpicking things. Seam ripper, my least favorite tool. But after this round of bits is sewn together, oh, again, of course, we'll be pressing them open over here with the ironing board. And look at me using the clapper. Must have been a warmer day down here because it has been rainy and chilly lately. Still here, we're having our April showers at the end of April into May here. And uh, so it's been chilly here in the basement. It's got tile floor. I'm half into the, you know, bedrock or whatever. So it's kind of chilly down here. And so I warm my hands pressing seams open, honestly. But now that all my side fronts, side fronts of my skirts are all sewn together, I sewed that center front seam and pressed it open. It's uh, top stitched to the center front seam of my skirt. That was boring, so we didn't talk about it. I was rambling about something else at the time. Um, but now I will pin my side panels with all their fancy patchwork to the plain central panel and sew those seams. This is where we eliminated the dart into the seam. No problem there. Basically now it is a style line without, uh, it's a style line that contributes to the fit as opposed to having a dart. But I will sew that here on the machine with our fancy 
ultraviolet blue lighting. I wish I could use different colors of light over here, but the camera uh, frame rate and the LED light rate for different colors uh, don't agree. So I can only use three different colors of light over here. And I do love my colored lighting as we know. But now that it's sewn, I will go ahead and press it open. I'm using my tailor's ham to press open the top area of this where it's curved again over the like belly of the body. And I'm just using that tailor's ham uh, to press the rest of this, even though it's straight, um, more so because my ironing board is kind of coming apart on me a little. And the tailor's ham is stuffed with like hard, um, like wood chips, I think is what's in a tailor's ham. So it's like a nice hard surface to press on as opposed to my ironing board, which is kind of given out on me. So I need to get a better ironing board, but I have not Googled it only so much time in a day. But now that this side panel is sewn onto the center front panel of my skirt, I will go ahead and top stitch that as well, because the nice thing about deciding to top stitch stuff and making it part of the design is that then I feel free to have visible stitching anywhere I want it. So, and this keeps things, you know, I have the seams pressed open on the inside and, you know, they might want to move around unless I top stitch them down like this. So it keeps everything nice and flat and smooth on the inside of the dress as well, especially when I'm not lining this. If I were lining this, I might not top stitch the crap out of it like I'm about to do. And you can see the way that that fabric shines in different lighting. It is slightly iridescent because of that reflective quality. But here I'm matching up the skirt backs to the front there once they're all constructed and all the chevrons are sewn. Um, and so I'm matching up my stripes and you know, you do run into the small issue of like tension on the machine or when you were cutting something out, something might be a tiny bit bigger or smaller by the time you get to this step where you match them up. So I just, because these fabrics have a slight bit of stretch into them, I can stretch one stripe a tiny bit if it has got turned out a little bit small so that it definitely matches up with the stripe from the front and the back. Like I'm prioritizing matching the stripes over having the tension be perfect, honestly. Hopefully that makes sense. Just because like once you're done sewing something, just because you, you know, made the pattern perfect, paper is easier to maintain a perfect sharp angle than in fabric, of course. Fabric wants to stretch out a place as soon as you start, you know, breathing in its general direction. But now I'm sewing my bodice backs together. So again, I have everything laid out. I'm matching pieces up one by one. I've done all the surging around all the edges of my pieces and I've flatlined the spandex pieces. You can tell that I flatlined them onto black sateen also, by the way, which I haven't mentioned. It's because I only had so much gray sateen. I only had like two yards of the gray and I really needed like two and a half. So for the stripes that were gonna be flatlined, I just used the same exact fabric in black because I had some, because you weren't gonna be seeing it. I mean, the inside you will, but uh, because it's the exact same texture, weight, exact same fabric, just a different colorway um, as the gray, it will behave the exact same way. Um, and since it wouldn't be seen, I reserved the gray for the blocks of color where it would be seen. Again, hopefully this makes any sense. The good news is I'm about to take a little bit of time off to write. And hopefully that goes well, knock on wood. I should, I feel like I'm jinxing it, even saying it. But hopefully that will be renewing for my silly little meat brain. And so I can stop feeling like, as I said recently on my updates podcast over on Patreon, like cooked spaghetti that's just been kind of like left in the strainer too long and solidified. It's not really how you want to feel in life. As usual, I have the um, problem of feeling like human emotions or like having any feelings is a bug in the system as opposed to a feature of the system of being a human being. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> and just like the skirt, of course, on these bodice pieces for the back here, I am pressing open and top stitching everything. You can see how these come together. The back pieces aren't very curvy, of course, because the princess seam, while there to go over the curve of the back, the curve of the back is usually less prominent than the curves in the front depending on the shape of the individual, of course. And once the uh, side backs are all sewn together, I can stitch that princess seam. So that's what I'm doing here. And because the back is all, the center back is all plain, I don't have to worry about matching up any stripes or anything at this point, which is nice. I was surprised at the gray uh, option of this one, that Instagram poll. The other options were black sateen with a like light green holographic spandex. And then what else was I thinking about doing? I don't even remember. Black and silver holographic kind of fabric, I think. Which isn't very stretchy. That fabric's kind of weird. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't win the poll because I don't exactly know what I want to do with that kind of strange holographic silver that I have in my stash. But I'm all about the different, testing out the different holographic 
weirdo fabrics right now. I just got in some iridescent organza that I want to kind of make a trench coat out of. So we'll see if I end up doing that. <laughs> we'll see. Here I am top stitching that princess seam now that it is sewn. You'll notice I didn't trim the curve of this princess seam. Um, because again, I'm top stitching it down and because I'm working with stretchy fabrics, I didn't exactly have to, so I didn't. So, you know me, always clip your curves is what I say, but what I do in practice is I assess each situation individually. But it's good practice to clip your curves, but not if you're not going to be lining the garment and you can get away with not doing it. <clears throat> There's caveats. There's fine print to all things. And now I'm starting to work on the front of the bodice, which... This is a lot of stripes, you know, it's a lot of pieces. So <laughs> I'm just doing all my tiny little stripes, stitching them all together. This gets kind of thick and bulky, even in these lighter weight fabrics that I was using last time, just because they're just so many stripes. Now we have half of them sewn together, moving along again, just doing this in batches so that I don't get mixed up and mix any of these stripes up. They do, you know, taper slightly from the bust to the waist. so. They are different widths, it's just not by much. So you don't want to mix them up, but you almost would be able to fudge it if you did because it's a very subtle difference. Pinning along here. And again, you can see I have no stripes interacting with the neckline. That again helps keeps it, keep it smooth. So the neckline is just in the gray. Although I have to use the black sateen to do the facing for this dress later because, again, I was running real low on the gray. I really needed two and a half yards of this gray, but I actually ended up ordering this gray sateen from Joanne's online. Um, and it took about 1,800 years to get to me, so I did that back in the past, apparently. But my gosh, ordering from Joanne's online is a nightmare. I'm so used to Mood, which gets stuff to me like in a week or less, and Joanne's. Oh man, it took me like three weeks for it to get to me. And I was like, I could have gone to the store. <laughs> I, I wanted to order online so I didn't have to go to the store, but turns out even going in was a better idea. And here I am matching up my stripes along the center front of my bodice. Again, stretching things to fit if they've stretched out of place on me and prioritizing the stripes lining up over, um, you know, a slight pucker in any of them. I'd rather it be slightly puckered and have the color match up. And top stitching takes care of that kind of thing a little bit too. So that's nice. But the um, Joanne's online, you can't order half yards. You can only order like two yards or four yards. And I was like, well, I don't want four yards. So I just got two and did what I could to work around it. I get that question actually quite often is like, what, how much yardage do you buy if you don't know what you're going to make? And my answer to this always is, I never have no idea what I'm going to make. I always know, oh, that fabric is good for a blouse. And if I'm going to make a blouse, if it's long sleeve, I'll buy two yards. If it's short sleeve, I'll buy one yard. Or like, I know that fabric, I want to make a skirt. And so I'll just buy one yard if it's a pencil skirt, two or three yards, depending on how full of a skirt I want otherwise. So I never have absolutely no idea what I'm going to make. If I know what I want to make a dress with short sleeves, but I'm not sure on what style of dress I want to make, I will buy two and a half yards. Because I can usually eke out something with three quarter sleeves if I have to out of two and half yards, but like for a short sleeved dress, usually like of either pencil or a line skirt, I usually can eke that out of two and a half yards. And that is because I am buying wide width fabrics. That's the other thing. Whenever people ask me how much fabric do I need, I'm like, mm, depends. Are you buying 45 width fabric? Or are you buying 54 inch width fabric? Because we all know I prefer wide width fab fabrics so that I can get away with only buying two and a half yards. And here I am top stitching those princess seams along the front with all of those stripes. Again, just making sure that none of the seam allowance that's pressed open on the inside, even though it's top stitched down, is getting flipped up and tucked in that seam in the wrong way. Because you want these things to remain as flat as possible. But finally, with all the fronts and the backs uh, assembled <laughs> with all those tiny pieces, I can sew the shoulder seams and the side seams. So that's what I'm doing here. Very easy compared to the rest of assembling the bits. And here I am putting my facing on. The outside of this facing has been surged, so it's finished. You can't really see the black thread on black. But again, I had to uh, do a black facing on this, which I would rather have done the gray. What are you gonna do? You gotta get it done somehow, you know? Luckily, because this dress has black top stitching and has like a black accent color, if you see a tiny bit of black at the neckline, it's not gonna be, you know, wildly unfortunate. But I'm just finishing this by sewing the facing or pinning the facing along the neckline, like I always would, right sides together. 
I will sew those together, clip the curves, and then I will go ahead and clip that uh, V neck here as well. Like so, you can see I drew that V in color pencil on there so I can see exactly where that point needed to be also. And I will clip down to that point, always nerve wracking, clip my curves, flip the spacing to the inside. I will do some under stitching on the spacing, press it into place and uh, eventually tack the shoulder seams to the shoulder seams of the dress so that nothing flops out of place on me. If I do anything like this out of fabrics that are in any way, shape or form itchy, like wool or some of the brocades I use can be quite itchy because they use uh, like plasticky kind of lurex in them. I will just go ahead and line it instead of doing a facing. But the nice thing about these fabrics is they're both quite like soft to the touch or against the skin. So I'm not worried about it. And also I'll probably be wearing a slip when wearing something like this. So all those seams on the inside won't be touching my skin anyway, because I'll just wear a slip underneath. Oh, the ceiling is squeaking in here. Interesting. Here I am under stitching my facing like so. And once again, look at that iridescence of this fabric. It's quite fun. In normal lighting, like I said, it's got like a subtle iridescence. Here I have the blue light on it a little bit, but it's mostly normal. I have like uh, recessed lighting here in the studio, of course, in the basement of this suburban house I work from. Although there was an amazing Victorian on Zillow today. It was very far north, <laughs> like nearer to uh, Canada than to New York, but uh, it was a gorgeous house. Oh, you know, I love them original features. Second Empire brick Victorians. Really my jam. Of course, I'm not in the position to buy a house yet myself, but I still like many millennials to browse Zillow for what I cannot have. So I was looking at Victorian stuff. I think it was like six bedrooms, three bathrooms. And do you want to know how much it was for that six bedroom Victorian with original features? $175,000, which is a lot of money. But I'll tell you what, it's not very much money for a six bedroom Victorian with original features, which is why I like looking in upstate New York. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll see where life takes me in these situations. But now that my bodice is all together, my sleeves are hemmed, which is what I was doing while I was rambling about Zillow. <clears throat> I just turned those half inch and top stitched them. You know, uh, I can go ahead and match up my skirt and bodice at the waist here. Make sure all the panels are matching up where they're supposed to. Again, prioritizing the stripes matching or the color blocks blocking together over whether or not I need to like kind of finagle them to fit. The pattern says that it should fit the way that fabric becomes like a non-Newtonian fluid while working with it says that sometimes it won't. And that is frustrating, especially if like this was no problem, the sateen one here. But again, that uh, Real Return Tomorrowland dress, the one from the Shine Lookbook, that gray fabric in that dress is not sateen. It's like some weird, puffy, neoprene-y feeling, like foam, it had like a foamy feel to the touch, which only people who have worked with a lot of different fabric are gonna know what the heck I'm talking about. But it just was spongy, almost. It wasn't like thick, like a neoprene, like a wetsuit fabric actually would be, but it was a little bit more like that. And that stuff stretched more than the spandex I was working with, honestly. And doing the sleeves, hemming the sleeves on that dress was a nightmare because they had stretch out of shape so much that gray fabric had. Ugh. And this one was like a breeze comparatively. But once I have it sewn together along that waist seam, I will press that open. And again, here I am warming my hands by doing that. I'm going to put a zipper in, of course, down the center back, a lap zipper, because it's me and that's just how I do every dress that I ever make. Um, so I'm putting the waistline together here, seeing where that zipper is going to end. And then I'm going to sew the dress shut beneath that zipper down to the hem. Well, not down all the way to the hem, I'm leaving myself like seven inches of slit down here, just for ease of, I don't know, running away from space aliens, I suppose. I don't know, hopefully nobody and nothing. And again, I had left myself one inch seam allowance on the back of this dress. So that is what I'm using here. And then I'm going to fold back the opening, the like rest of this dress from the zipper up where the zipper will be, folding back the edges one inch. And then I will press this folded edge into place. So I have this nice clean opening in the back to put my zipper into, like always. And again, like I say every time, if you have a zipper method that works for you, Stick with it, buddy. We're all just trying to get our zippers into things. For some reason, zippers are evil. There's probably people out there who are like, oh, I have no trouble with zippers. And to you, I say, good on you, you know? 
Even me, after hundreds of zippers, I still don't love them. I should just baste them in and like take my time and be patient, but I don't know if you've ever seen this channel before, that's just not my nature. People are wondering like what I consider like top tier sewing because I do not consider myself like a top tier seamstress. And sometimes people are like, stop saying you're bad at sewing, which like I'm not bad at sewing. I'm just saying I'm mediocre compared to people like, um, if you've ever seen the blog Lilacs and Lace, now that gal knows how to sew, okay? That's like a home couturier situation. Or like if you've ever seen videos of like how this Dior dress was made for their couture show, like those seamstresses in Paris, those are seamstresses. Me, eh, <laughs> I have a small amount of training compared to these people and even less patience, obviously. But here I am sewing the overlapped part of my zipper now that it has been overlapped over the teeth and the stitching. I've switched the side on my zipper foot here, this funky little zipper foot that works on this old machine. And some people like to do their zippers while things are flat and so this side seems last also, which I can understand why, but this is, everything has like pros and cons to me. So I like that this is like diff, the most difficult and annoying part is putting the zipper in, but it's also the second to last step that I ever have to do. Here I am cutting my zipper tape and just finishing the edges by burning them so that it, the nylon melts a little bit and it won't unravel. And then I will pin my facing down towards the inside like this so everything is nice and cleanly finished. And I will just tack that down to the zipper tape by hand and then put a hook and eye here at the top. None of that I'm going to show you, so sorry. But then the last step for this is hemming it. So that's kind of what I like about doing my zippers almost last is that like once I'm done with the frustration of the zipper, all I have to do is hem it and at least I'm done with the whole project. Which does mean like if I mess up on the zipper and like screw up, that means I like wasted my whole project. But that's all right. <laughs> There's many uh, space, there's a lot of space for catastrophe in sewing, unfortunately, but I've avoided many over the years, luckily. And here is my new finished realtor in Tomorrowland dress, or perhaps this can be the uh, solicitor in Night City, perhaps, um, if you follow Cyberpunk 2077, which is now officially the only video game I have played and I'm having a great time. I am very pleased with how this dress came out. It's a little bit cleaner than the last version, actually, just because the sateen was a lot easier to work with than the gray fabric from the realtor in Tomorrowland dress. It was on sale on Mood one time, so I picked up a couple yards and now I know how it ended up on sale because it was just a strange texture to be working with and it was stretching out in all sorts of places so that dress from the shine lookbook was a bit of a nightmare and this was actually a lot easier to put together and also let me know if you wouldn't mind seeing more projects like this because i do have more fabrics and like color combos earmarked for this sort of thing and i can make them off camera or i can make them on camera it's kind of up to you if you want to see more of this so let me know below and thank you as always for watching today i'll be back with more sewing vintage fashion costuming and crafting real soon so i'll see you then bye